next speaker is Valerie Evner. Uh, she's a professor and ecologist with the Department of Plant Sciences at UC Davis. So Valerie, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm just start getting the slide shared. All right. So uh, thank you so much to Whitney and Gail for organizing this uh, great session today. And I don't need to tell anybody in this audience that we know uh, we are struggling with a lot more frequent fire than we're used to uh, seeing. And so we don't always know what we're doing in terms of grassland management uh, in the context of these large wildfires and in a number of sites, uh, frequently repeated wildfires. And one key challenge is that the wildfire response is often pretty different from prescribed uh, burns. And we have a lot of information from prescribed burns, but we have a lot less information, especially before and after, uh, about prescribed fires. And so we had a great opportunity at Hopland Research and Extension Center to get a better sense of what the effects of wildfire um, are compared to unburned compared to prescribed fire. And this was, we happen to have a number of uh, long-term study sites uh, at Hopland uh, for oh, about 12 years before uh, the Mendocino fire uh, hit in J July, 2018. Uh, when you look at the landscape at Hopland, it was on the edge of the Mendocino uh, fire. So that gives us areas that were exposed to wildfire adjacent to areas uh, that were unburned. What we also had was uh, very different grazing practices across different pastures at Hopland. And so here you can see in the foreground, it was an ungrazed pasture that uh, burned very heavily to the point that you can see here, the fence post actually uh, burned adjacent to a heavily grazed pasture that you can barely even tell a burn um, hit that pasture. And then Hopland had also done a number of prescribed burns about a month before that wildfire hit. So we had a number of prescribed burns to look at that were outside the wildfire zone, but also some areas that had prescribed burns uh, that also had the wildfire come through. And so this gave us the ability to be able to understand uh, the effects of different kinds of fire on uh, different species in the system. And so when we're thinking about rangelands, the first thing we always think about is forage production. So uh, how do wildfires influence uh, how much productivity there is uh, the year after? And a great review of a number of studies by uh, Teresa Bichetti and colleagues had found that in the first year after fire, on average, there's a decrease in forage productivity by 40%. And even three years after fire, there's some decrease. And that is totally the opposite of what we found, probably because the year after the Mendocino fire was a really wet year. And so, uh, as Rebecca had talked about, there's all of these potential stimulating impacts of the fire. A lot of nutrients are available. There's a lot uh, less thatch that can be uh, inhibiting in terms of shade. And so uh, in black here, we have our above ground uh, biomass at peak biomass uh, the spring after the fire. And for all the graphs, you'll see the unburned uh, plots are on the left, the prescribed burn are in the middle, and the wildfire plots are on the right. So uh, if you look at the unburned productivity compared to that of the prescribed burn and wildfire, you can see the fires greatly enhance productivity, so about 1.6 fold increase. If you look at our pictures, this is my collaborator, Mary Cadenasso, who's over six feet tall. This is her standing in an unburned um, plot. This is her on the same day standing in a burned plot, right? Very, very large uh, difference in the grass height and the productivity. So this is in the ungrazed. When we look at uh, the grays, so the ungrazed is going to stay uh, here in black. The gray now is our uh, ungrazed pastures. And what you can see, very slight trend to increase biomass uh, production with uh, the fires, but essentially grazing really muted the uh, stimulatory effect on forage production. And essentially, this is what we'd expect in terms of grazing, we know is going to decrease fuel load. So we expect a lower intensity of fire. So if there is a flush of nutrients and things like that, we expect that to be lower in a system where we've given the system less uh, fuel and less intense fire. <clears throat> 
Where this becomes really critical in terms of thinking about vegetation composition and especially weeds is thinking about what the effects of potentially that decreased fire intensity in grazed areas will be on seed survival. And this is really important, especially for our uh, annual grasses. Our annual grasses have very, very little seed bank. Uh, maybe about 1% of seeds carry over from one year to the next uh, in the soil. So in general, what happens is those seeds wind up uh, falling right late in the spring. They sit in that thatch layer uh, for most of the summer. So about 85% of seed production from a given year is sitting in that thatch layer, which makes it incredibly vulnerable uh, to wildfire. This could provide a great opportunity or right, a big crash of our system, uh, depending on your perspective, right? And Rebecca had mentioned that blank slate. So uh, we're very concerned about to what extent uh, do our seeds essentially get wiped out uh, with the fire coming through. The only study we've seen that have looked at before and after uh, a wildfire effects on the seed bank has been one done by uh, Ed Allen's lab, where they showed that overall there was a sevenfold loss in germination, so essentially sevenfold increase in um, uh, dead seeds uh, after fire, and germination of dominant grasses uh, decreased fiftyfold. So that's an incredible impact, and it's something that we're really concerned about. You can see in this picture, this is a bunch of goat grass seeds sitting on top of the soil surface after the fire came through. And whether this is viable or not is a really key management question. So first we're gonna look just at the general uh, species composition. And thanks to Rebecca for doing such a great uh, introduction of the key players in the system. Uh, so what we have here is in an ungrazed plot, same as before, unburns on the left, prescribed burns in the middle, and wildfires on the right. And here we have the number of seedlings that have emerged from a seedling core. So essentially, we took a core um, from all of, well, we took many cores from all of our pastures uh, that in included both the burn thatch layer as well as a few centimeters deep into the soil, brought them into the greenhouse and saw what seeds were viable and which ones emerged into seedlings. And so uh, in this graph, the black bars are looking at grass uh, germination and the red bars are looking at our forb or wildflower germination. And you can see that, right, unburned, not surprisingly, we have a huge number of uh, grass seeds that are emerging, those are greatly decreased. So we see a sevenfold uh, decrease in germination of grasses in both prescribed and wildfires. So those fires did a very good job at very high seed mortality for the grasses. For the forbs in red, it's a much more muted uh, effect. Here, uh, the fires only decrease uh, germination of forbs by about 33%. So this is ungrazed. How about grazed? So if we think about our biomass effects, we assume the fire has been uh, more muted in the graze, and so we'd see less of an in impact on seed mortality. So the top graph is exactly what you just saw before uh, in the ungrazed system. Uh, in the grazed plots, if again you start looking at the black bars, which are grasses, just as we'd expect. In the graze system, we have less fuel, less intense fire, much less uh, mortality of our seeds. And so we see a lot more seedlings coming up in our prescribed and wildfires uh, in grazed pastures than we did in ungrazed pastures. For our forbs, which are here uh, in red, we see a really different pattern and interestingly, uh, right, we see actually more forbs coming up, especially in the wildfire in the graze system than the ungrazed. Uh, and this is really important. This feeds off really nicely of some recent work that uh, Lauren Hallett and Katie Suding and colleagues had done at Sierra Foothills Research Extension Center, where they found that moderate grazing over time was really critical in keeping a very robust forb seed bank. Uh, so lots of wildflowers, get, seeds getting built up in that soil. And what they found was that was the most important thing in terms of drought resilience, that if you had good wildflower uh, seed bank, 
when you had a crash due to uh, drought, those forbs were able to come in and maintain uh, productivity and diversity and cover and erosion control. So they were super important. We're seeing the same thing in terms of fire, right? The fact that we had grazing and wildfire actually increases um, forb, uh, forbs coming out is really suggests that uh, the long-term grazing has increased uh, the seed bank of those emergency first responders we have in the system. So this is who survived in terms of uh, seeds. What does that look like in terms of the end of the first growing season? So uh, on this uh, graph again, we have unburned on the left, prescribed in the middle, and wildfire on the right. Again, black bars are grasses and red uh, bars or forbs. We also now have green bars, which are our legumes or our nitrogen fixing forbs. We couldn't usually tell the difference at the little tiny seedling stage, but at the flowering stage, they were very easy to tell. And then the blue bars are looking at bare ground. So not surprisingly, in the burn treatments, we had more bare ground. But when we think about the species composition, uh, it's really surprising. Remember, our burned our burned uh, system, particularly in the ungrazed, had a huge hit on grass um, seed survival. But grass cover at the end of the first season barely changes in response to fire. So essentially this tells us that even with a highly knocked back seed bank, that grass can essentially come and still be dominant. Uh, but what we see with the forbs in red and uh, the legumes in green is we also see that those greatly increase in response to fire, uh, very much in keeping with what we know in our rangelands where disturbances, uh, those grass, the, sorry, the forbs and uh, the legumes are very important uh, in response to disturbances. What's also really important is the type of fire very much shifts. Uh, who comes back. So in our prescribed fire, it was pretty much just erodium or fillery. So it's right, it's a great forage species, but it's not very exciting in terms of diversity. Versus in the wildfire, we saw dozens of wildflower uh, species coming up um, after fire. So a uh, large diversity of forbs, including some of our native bulbs. Same thing with legumes. In the prescribed fire, we essentially increase the clovers that we often see on uh, uh, dominating rangelands, so things like subclover and rose clover. Versus in the wildfire, we saw more than a dozen species of uh, clover. We saw many species of uh, lotus and a couple species of lupin, so much more diverse response uh, in response to wildfire. We also saw, um, especially in wildfire, higher perennial grasses and higher uh, amounts of perennial bulbs. So this is in the grazed. How about ungrazed? So from everything else we've saw about ungrazed, uh, sorry, about grazed, we expect a more muted effect of fire on um, the composition. So again, the ungrazed you've just seen is on top, the grazed is on the bottom. And what's really interesting here is even though seed survival in uh, the grazed system uh, was much higher uh, in response to prescribed fire and wildfire, that's where we see a decrease in grass cover, right? We don't see a decrease in grass cover in that ungrazed system in response to fire, even though the seed bank took such a big hit. But we do see some of that in response to grazing. And we also see a much larger increase in the amount of forbs and legumes. Uh, so, right, we see in gray systems a stronger uh, change in vegetation composition compared to the ungrazed uh, burn systems. So, this is the general composition. How about our noxious weeds? And so, in Hopland, when we're talking about noxious weeds, we're mostly talking about goat grass and medusa head. And so uh, these graphs are gonna be parallel to what you've seen before. First, we're going to focus on the number of seedlings that are uh, surviving. Uh, the black bars are goat grass and the red bars are medusa head. And so when we're looking at our ungrazed um, system, which is the only uh, graph you can see so far, and we look at medusa head, very high in the unburned, virtually disappeared in both types of fire. For goat grass in the black, uh, we definitely have a strong decrease in uh, the surviving uh, seed bank, but 
it's a little bit more muted than we see for Medusa head. Now, how does this compare to uh, grazed pastures? So again, uh, our ungrazed is just on top, bottom is same thing, looking at black bars are goat grass, red bars are Medusa head. Uh, the first thing you'll notice, very clearly, we have a lot more Medusa head uh, seeds in our ungrazed system and a lot more goat grass seeds in our, sorry, yeah, in, in our grazed and a lot more Medusa head in our ungrazed um, pastures. When we look at uh, the patterns, again, we do see decreases in um, both goat grass and uh, Medusa head uh, seeds that are surviving uh, in response uh, to fire. Uh, in the graze, but when we look at the amount of uh, seeds that are left that are viable, there are more goat grass and medusa head uh, viable seeds in our graze and our ungrazed uh, uh, pastures, which again makes sense because we know with the removal of biomass, we probably got a lot weaker uh, fire coming through. So this is surviving seeds. How about percent cover? How about what was the actual vegetation that emerged after uh, the first year. So you're gonna keep seeing the seed survival on the left and what we're adding on the right is the percent cover uh, at the end of the first growing season after fire. Uh, and first let's focus on the Medusa head in red, right? So in ungrazed, we see that um, both burns definitely decrease uh, Medusa head uh, cover, not as completely as they decrease Medusa head seed survival. So even a little bit of seed survival can lead to uh, some recovery um, of uh, Medusa head. When we look in um, our grazed pastures, we see that we have uh, slightly dampened effect of grazing. So we still do see that uh, our fires decrease uh, Medusa head uh, seed survival and cover, but not as strongly as they do in the ungrazed. Now, same graphs, we're just switching to focusing on goat grass um, instead. So again, when we think in the ungrazed system, we see a big hit in um, goat grass seed survival, but lots of goat grass still winds up establishing um, in that first year. So it's certainly, right, still manageable. Um, Rebecca had talked about the importance of getting in there and controlling weeds immediately after fire, right, in case of wildfire. We've only got 10% uh, goat grass cover. That's a really good time to get in there and um, do some uh, long-term uh, control options. Just as we saw um, with Medusa head, when we look at uh, percent cover in uh, the graze system, we do have more muted effects of the wildfire. So we do have more goat grass um, cover in response to wildfire in the graze system compared to the ungrazed. So this is that first growing season, uh, 20, 2019, after one year after fire. Does this right, partial recovery of goat grass and Medusa head just keep spiraling so that we have a lot of uh, like full recovery in the second season. So I just moved the 2019 data, the first data over here to the left, and now we're gonna add the 2020 data after the second year after the fire on the right. And essentially, if you look at um, the general trends in both goat grass um, and Medusa head in 2019, we see the same general trends in 2020 uh, on both the grazed and ungrazed pasture. The one key difference is we see a pretty strong recovery of goat grass in our prescribed fire in our ungrazed um, system, but we don't see that the little bit of recovery we had in the first year leads to even more in the second year. We're actually seeing about the same levels of control. So this is great news because this means that uh, seeds got knocked back enough and cover got not knocked back enough that first year that couldn't fully recover the second year. It's Medusa head and goat grass, so they are going to recover. But what this tells us is we have a good window to do something about them. And the thing I'm going to suggest trying to do about them is thinking about native perennial grasses. Uh, so we had a lot more native perennial grasses than we had realized a lot of these sites and we could see them re-sprouting within a couple weeks after fire. 
And this might be a good time post-fire to come in and reset some of our most invaded systems by planting in perennial grasses. And so just to show an example of this, this is a non-fire study um, we've done, but we planted uh, goat grass and medusa head seeds uh, with in green here with our dominant annual grasses. So things like our um, uh, wild oats and our bromes uh, and our um, wild, our exotic wild rye. And uh, so in green here, we have the percent of Medusa head and goat grass when it was grown with those species. And right, essentially it was a little roller coaster. They were high some years, low other years, a super low year is in the middle of our drought. Um, so we know that our dominant species aren't doing a very good job at suppressing goat grass and Medusa head. But at the same time, we also planted these noxious uh, grass seeds with um, a mix of native uh, grasses. So our uh, purple needle grass and a few of our wild rye, And those results are in blue. So this is looking at the percent cover of Medusa head and goat grass when planted with those noxious, oh, sorry, with the natives. And you can see they still have some ups and downs, but they're kept suppressed to a much um, greater level. And so this is something that uh, we are now working on to see is post fire a good window of opportunity to get native grasses in to suppress these noxious weeds. And so we're working with some of the UC natural reserve systems that just got hit by the LNU fire this last um, year to do some of this restoration and see if that works. Of course, fire is going to be very year dependent. It's going to be very site dependent. So uh, we've uh, had the good fortune to partner with Pepperwood Preserve as well as Sierra Foothills Research Extension Center, which have also had fires uh, in some different years and looking at uh, the effects of fire and grazing interactions on vegetation. So just to sum up um, what we found, essentially when we're thinking about post uh, fire, the key first responders are going to be our native perennial grasses, our native bulbs, and our wildflowers. Uh, so it's super important to maintain them in the landscape because they're what is recovering best. And particularly those native grasses may provide some of the best long-term suppression of goat grass and medusa head. When we think about grazing before uh, the wildfire, it is really important in terms of enhancing that wildflower seed bank. So uh, the resilience of our grasslands in response to things like drought and fire really depend on making sure we have a good seed bank and um, moderate grazing levels really do provide that. We also see that fires actually can um, provide that as well. It gives them a opportunity to become a lot higher in uh, cover and then they can um, uh, replenish the seed bank. In terms of grazing, it can be a really important tool in decreasing some of the wildfire impacts. So we get a lower burn intensity and less seed mortality, um, and we get higher recovery of forbs and legumes, which can be really good uh, forage quality and really important for diversity. But grazing can also decrease some aspects of uh, wildfire that are positive. Uh, so that big increase in forage production we have is muted in grazed pastures and the decrease in goat grass and medusa head we have in response to fire are also muted in grazed pastures. And finally prescribed burns can be really important um, impacts on vegetation uh, and particularly uh, goat grass and medusa head, right, they can be really important but they do uh, have less recovery of diverse species than we see in wildfires. So thank you so much and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Valerie. We have quite a few questions in the chat here. Um, so the first question is, how do you account for the different effects of prescribed burns and wildfire? Is it just the time of year the fire occurs? It's a really good question. And unfortunately, we don't fully know, right? Um, our best guess is it's a few things. Uh, so it is a different time um, of year. What we also know is, uh, it can be the same day, but if you're in a pasture, right, that's on a little bit hotter exposure than another, like you can get that sweet spot where you knock out, um, say, especially some of the noxious grass weeds on one, but not the other. So, right, it's not just about, right, that exact timing, but the local um, scale differences. Uh, we also, with the, so there, there may be some aspect um, of that. We also know in general prescribed fires don't tend to get as intense as some of these um, wildfires. 
Um, and when folks have been studying prescribed well, uh, sorry, prescribed fires and looking at post-vegetation uh, recovery, they find that what comes in from the borders, so something Rebecca had talked about um, being really important versus a wildfire is so much bigger that we don't have as much of that recruitment from the borders. Okay, um, a similar question, how does fire timing affect your results? Really good question. Um, so based on what we've looked at, I can't, so far I can't answer that. Hopefully uh, we have, we've collected the data, we just haven't analyzed it yet. Looking at, uh, so this was a burn in late July and early August. Um, the one in Sierra Foothills was, I think, late June. Uh, the ones at Pepperwood uh, were late October into early November. So hopefully, um, by comparing some of uh, those, we'll be able to get some sense of, there's obviously site differences, but also we might get some sense of uh, effects of when the fire is. But at least for the idea of, right, seeds that are sitting there uh, in the thatch, our guess is once you've gotten to the point where the seeds have all fallen down into the thatch, it might be pretty um, similar. Hey, there's quite a few questions, so I'm going to ask you one more, and then if maybe if you have time to type some answers, sure. we can launch the polls. Okay. Um, how did the prescribed burns compare to those wildfires in intensity, heat, etc.? Yeah, so unfortunately, it wasn't measured because obviously, right, we're the, the Hopland had done the prescribed fires to manage for goat grass, and it was just kind of the normal prescribed fires you always do to manage for that kind of thing. And so we didn't think to like measure those things is obviously we didn't know a wildfire was coming a month later. So uh, certainly from the, our best indication is we did, because we had a lot of plots we were measuring for some other experiments across the station. So we did have um, biomass levels before and at at least 12 of the sites. So we had biomass levels before the fire and then after the fire and we actually had seed banks before and after um, the fire in at least a subset of the sites that um, we looked at and then after immediately after the fire we um, took not only the seed bank samples but we actually looked at um, right the ash slash remaining thatch um, so we could get a sense of how intense things um, had burned and we had actually a lot of equipment out there and we could see how things right did our plastic boxes like completely disintegrate or were they slightly charred so we had some general feel of that. So like our guesses is that the prescribed burns were far less intense than the wildfire was, but um, we, we didn't actually measure it. That's the thing with wildfires, like you, you don't know they're coming to measure things. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll, everyone, and Valerie will try to answer some more of the questions in the Q&A. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, you, everyone should be able to vote now. Okay, there I see some votes coming in. Okay, give everyone a second or two more. Looks like most folks have voted. Okay, so Valerie, if you don't mind really quickly addressing sure. the poll results. So question one, when comparing wildfire versus prescribed fire effects on noxious, noxious grass seed survival. So Whitney, I don't see them. Oh, that's because I didn't share them. There, there we go. go, okay. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so this first one is actually a little um, tricky, right? So it, it is as everything in ecology is, it depends, um, right? So particularly um, for Medusa head, both prescribed fires and wildfires really knock them back to like extremely minimal um, uh, levels. Uh, there was a slight lower amount of surviving seed of Medusa head uh, than goat cross. Uh, in the prescribed in the wildfire versus prescribed, but you you know it was so low you couldn't even see it. Goat grass did have um, more mortality in the uh, wildfire, uh, and then yes, for grazing before wildfire uh, leads to more muted effects on vegetation biomass and on um, goat grass and Medusa. Uh, head uh, reductions, but we actually see that in terms of wildflowers, uh, they actually re respond more um, in the grazed pastures than the ungrazed pastures. Okay, so for question two, uh, grazing before a wildfire leads to more muted effects of wildfire on the vegetation community. Oh, sorry, I just answered that. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. All right. Then that is it. Okay. So, Valerie, if you have a moment to keep answering those questions, we would appreciate it. Yes, I will we'll keep answering. Ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. And we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation. Okay.